This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Andrew Peach, and in the early hours of Monday the 12th of August, these are our main stories. The Saudi-led coalition in Yemen has warned its separatist former allies they'll be hit hard unless they withdraw from Aden. Pro-democracy protesters and police have clashed in Hong Kong as both sides change tactics. And Norwegian police label the shooting at a mosque near Oslo an attempted act of terror. Also in this podcast... Everybody should know how we feed our cows, how we treat them. The dairy farmers taking their herds off dry land. Let's begin this podcast in Yemen, where the Saudi-led coalition is warning of more airstrikes unless southern separatists withdraw from the city of Aden. It was seized Sunday after days of fighting in what Saudi forces are calling a coup. Fighters of the Southern Transitional Council, who want southern Yemen to break away from the rest of the country, are now in a standoff with the Saudi-led coalition that's been trying to restore the internationally recognised government. Let's hear from the Yemeni government, effectively now a government in exile. The Deputy Foreign Minister, Mohammed al-Hadrami, is in Saudi Arabia, along with President Hadi, and reacted to events in Aden. Let me be clear. What's happening in Aden is both unfathomable and unacceptable as well. I mean, you've been hearing the news unfolding. I say unfathomable because, first of all, we did not understand and cannot probably accept how a terrorist attack by the Houthis on one of the units, unfortunately, that resulted in the deaths of many dozens, be used and exploited to turn the guns against the government in Aden. So has the coalition now fallen apart? I asked our Arab Affairs editor, Sebastian Usher. It looks that way to an extent. I think that's probably slightly over-egging it. I mean, what you have are two of the main forces within it. Obviously, the soldiers who owe their primary loyalty to the president, Abdurrabu Manzo Hadi, and they're backed very strongly by Saudi Arabia. And we saw today that the Saudis made a big point of showing King Salman, the king of Saudi Arabia, with President Hadi and report on that both in the Yemeni government press and in Saudi Arabia to, to show we're standing by our man. The other side of it is from a southern perspective, from a separative perspective, this president is useless. He was useless before he was forced into exile. His government didn't do any good for them. They're looking through this conflict, if it achieves anything, is change, not to have things as they were before, to have their own rule where they believe that there'll be less corruption, there'll be less control coming from outside, they'll be able to run their affairs much better than at the moment. What we saw today, which gives some hope about perhaps a resolution of this particular problem, is that it's been quiet, calls for talks, but the government, the, the internationally recognised government, which essentially is still really in Saudi Arabia, and certainly now that it's lost Aden for now, has been accusing the UAE, not just the separatists, of turning against them. Now, that's where the split could be. But I have a feeling that the Saudis and the UAE won't want this to get out of hand between themselves. Yes, their agenda is somewhat different, but they don't want their coalition, the, the, the lives that have been lost, to look as if it's all been for nothing. Ah, Arab Affairs editor Sebastian Usher with me. Now, for more background on all of this, my colleague James Menendez has been talking to the journalist Iona Craig, who's been reporting on Yemen for almost a decade about why the separatists and pro-government forces are clashing. The separatists have been a growing movement in southern Yemen since 2007. Um, it goes back to the previous states where there was a north and, and south Yemen as two separate states until 1990. But that growing movement then was supported by the UAE when the Saudi-led coalition became involved in the conflict in Yemen in 2015. The UAE financially supported and created militias and paramilitary units that were made up of these separatists. And the reason they picked these separatists is because the UAE didn't want to empower Islam, which is Yemen's um, Islamist political party and also encompasses the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, the UAE see the Muslim Brotherhood as a threat. Uh, and the separatists equally loathe, if you like, the, the, the Islam party in Yemen as well. And they had previously fought before. The separatist forces had fought against Hadi's government before. And we've just heard that the separatists do have control um, of Aden now, but it's very much with the backing of the UAE, if you like. They wouldn't be where they are. The SDC would never have even been created two years ago if it hadn't been for the financial and political backing of, of the United Arab Emirates. And so how much of a complicating factor is this uh, fight within a fight, if you like? 
Well, it's been more complicated now because, of course, the UAE have been withdrawing troops and withdrawing their involvement in the ground war, which has been extensive for the last four years now. And so this really leaves all of this problem really now for the Saudis to deal with. And previously, when this fighting went on previously, the Saudis were kind of more on the side of Hadi and the UAE with the separatists. But now this is a problem that the Saudis are going to have to try and sort out. And of course, you know, we've seen with the statement that came out last night, the Saudis are trying the carrot and stick. So they threatened these airstrikes or military action if the separatist forces didn't withdraw, while at the same time saying to saying all parties should come to Riyadh for talks. So it's going to be difficult for them to defuse the situation, particularly now the separatists have the upper hand and think they're in the better position where the so-called legitimate government of President Hadi has, it's now almost a second coup after that, after the Houthis coup took power in, in Sana'a in 2014. They've been ousted from their second seat of power in Aden in the last few days. Yemen specialist Iona Craig. Next to Hong Kong, where there have been further violent clashes between pro-democracy protesters and police. In one district, petrol bombs were thrown as riot police fired volleys of tear gas. As demonstrations enter their 10th weekend, tactics on both sides seem to be changing. Protesters are gathering in numerous smaller groups and the police are upping the use of force when making arrests. A video circulating widely on social media shows one young protester pinned to the ground by two police officers, one wearing jeans. He's shouting, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, stop pressing on my head with blood pouring from his face. Mary Hoy is a journalist for the online news site Quartz. She's covered all the protests in Hong Kong since they began back in June. James Menendez asked her what she'd witnessed in today's round of clashes. I personally was out in North Point, this uh, staunchly pro-China neighbourhood, where protesters initially had set their route, but ultimately decided to march elsewhere. And uh, in North Point, there were a number of pro-China men from the Fujianese province who possibly were looking to attack protesters. And there were numerous scuffles. We've just seen lots of arrests by riot police as they've pushed in aggressively to uh, arrest protesters in different areas of Hong Kong. And just thinking about pro-Beijing demonstrators, how numerous are they? Are they just a tiny minority or are there more people? They're just the quieter voices, if you like. It's hard to tell. What we can see is that they've held several pro-China, pro-police rallies in the past 10 weeks. They do have a presence, of course, in social media. Although, you know, as you're walking around neighbourhoods and you have riot police their uh, present, a lot of residents will come down and start heckling and booing the riot police and telling them to leave the neighborhood in peace. So I think that goes to show you that your everyday average citizen is not very welcoming of the riot police. And in terms of the pro-democracy protesters, of course, a few weeks ago, we were seeing a million, two million people out on the streets, and we haven't seen that. Does that mean they're losing steam or are they just changing? I think it's a changing tactic. There hasn't been a really a big push to host one of those big rallies in the past several weeks. The tactic has changed towards something more fluid. And I wonder if that will now change again, given that we saw news of police officers dressing up as protesters and ambushing protesters and making arrests there. So on online forums now, I'm seeing debates raging to whether the tactic to continue on is to keep doing these flowing, unpredictable protests or to do something else. The Hong Kong journalist Mary Hoy. A floating dairy farm populated by a herd of cows milked by robots has opened in the Dutch city of Rotterdam. The owners say the platform could be replicated all over the world to help farmers who are hit by flooding. Investigating for us, Anna Holligan. We're stomping through puddles with Minka van Vingerden, one of the founding farmers. We're just approaching the platform now. These cows look as though they're completely unfazed by our presence. This breed, Maas Rijn Eisel cows, they are very calm, they are very relaxed. It's hard to believe there are 32 cows on this platform when they are so silent. They've got very good manners. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you listen very carefully, you might just hear the brown and white cows munching on their hay.
Peter van Wingerden is Minka's partner. What you can see happening in all ports in the world is that ships are getting bigger and bigger and they do not fit in these old ports. He has two main ambitions here, to shrink the milk miles and make cities more self-sufficient. We have a climate change, so we have sea level rising, we have heavy rainfall, but it do not hurt the buildings on the water. It's, it's what we call climate adaptive buildings. I can feel the, the platform moving under my feet, so it will rise and fall with the, the rising bigger. tide. And actually, it was it was partly a weather condition that inspired you. Yeah, that's correct. We were actually working on a housing project in New York City on the Hudson River uh, just shortly after Hurricane Sandy really wrecked a lot of parts of Manhattan. There was no fresh food anymore available in, in, in shops. No trucks could come in or out the city. And that's when somebody said to us, can you design something inside the city that is not affected by any storm or hurricane or flooding. And that's where we started to design this one. Is this the future of, of milk and cheese? It will be a hybrid system. So Everybody should know how we feed our cows, how we treat them, but also how we process the milk and the manure. And I can see the robot over there. So this whole farm is run by robots. A collection of the manure, the milking. It collects all the manure and it brings it to a hole in the corner of the stable. And because we separate it so quickly, the odor, the smell is less than when you keep it together. And the farmer, he lives uh, a, few, a few hundred meters from here, but he has uh, everything on his uh, phone. So if there's a problem, he immediately gets an alarm and he, he's in the farm in a few minutes. So we make farming sexy and attractive again. To try to entice the young people to consider it a career option. Yes, yes. Anna Holligan reporting from Rotterdam. Still to come in this podcast... That good old selfie is one of the primary reasons why we have so much popularity in this space. The Islamic fashion stars that are going global. Norwegian police say they're treating the recent shooting at a mosque in Oslo as an attempted act of terrorism. Police said the attacker was a young man of Norwegian background who appeared to hold far-right and anti-immigrant views. Worshippers at the mosque say the man wearing a helmet and carrying weapons opened fire after entering the building last night. A mosque board member, Erfan Mushtak, told reporters how an elderly worshipper restrained the gunman. So this guy came to the door and this our hero, a man of 75 years old, he was very fast in the reaction. So he just sat down, he was just sat down to read the Quran, he got up and he just started moving towards this uh, terrorist attacker. He, even though this terrorist attacker was shooting at the same time and he took control of him from the front. And he called on the government to take action to protect the Muslim population. For so many years, the secret police says the Muslims are the biggest risk for this country. But if you look at those last two major incidents of terrorist activities, it's non-Muslims who have done this. So, and this is affecting our children, because uh, the identity of our children has been broken up. We are harassed uh, on a daily basis. And it's time for the Norwegian government to take a clear standpoint where what they're going to do moving forward to make us uh, secure. Speaking in the city of San Vika, outside a temporary mosque that's been set up after the attack, the Norwegian Prime Minister Erna Solberg said it was important to continue the fight against hate speech. Well, I think we need to do the work that we are doing on uh, combating uh, you know, hate speech. Uh, we have a special action plan towards that, which is not just on Islamophobia, but also on a lot of other issues where you have hate speech. Uh, we have to work in schools. Uh, to work on their empathy level, to understand each other. Uh, and, and sorry to say, if I look at my own Facebook page, it's not the young kids who are the problem, it's in fact the elderly people who are uh, having thoughts and views that are more in the extreme views against uh, Islam. So we are trying to combat this, but it is, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, I think it's a worldwide challenge these days. The Norwegian Prime Minister, Enna Solberg. 
Now to Syria, where reports suggest government forces alongside their Russian allies have seized a town on the edge of Idlib province. Dozens of people are reported to have been killed. Monitors from the Syrian Observatory say the troops have seized control of the town of Al-Habit. The move would be their first real ground advance since they launched an offensive back in April. Sam Heller is a senior analyst at the International Crisis Group and has been speaking to James Menendez. The Syrian military's capture uh, of Al-Habit uh, is just one step uh, as part of its advance towards what looks like an attempt to capture the entire northern Hama countryside. But this is an area that is part of the broader Idlib area, or the Idlib de-escalation zone, but which actually reaches below, south from Idlib province into neighboring Hama. It's an area that the Syrian military uh, had attempted to capture previously uh, in April, but it faced uh, a particularly uh, robust and coordinated uh, resistance by local rebels. This time, uh, it looks like Damascus has received redoubled support from its Russian ally, including uh, intensified airstrikes, potentially a role for Russian special operators alongside Syrian troops on the ground, and against which Idlib's rebels uh, seem to have little rejoinder. What is the the, the wider strategy here on behalf of the, the Syrian government and its Russian allies? Is it to take the whole of Idlib provinces? Is that the goal? Well, I think that we have to disaggregate Damascus and Moscow in this respect. So the ultimate strategic goal of Damascus and the Syrian government is the recapture of the entirety of territorial Syria, full stop, inclusive of, of all territory nationwide. And so they, they remain interested in, uh, in taking Idlib in that respect. In addition, Idlib is a foothold for Turkish influence inside Syria, and it is a concentration of Islamist rebels that are particularly anathema to Damascus, which views uh, Muslim Brotherhood-style Islamists as an existential threat. Sam Heller, who's a senior analyst at the International Crisis Group. Global brands like Burberry, Dolce & Gabbana and DKNY are just some of the latest fashion houses attempting to crack one of the fastest growing markets, Islamic fashion. What started as brands targeting wealthy Muslims with one-off fashion lines for religious occasions has grown to become a global trend for women who prefer to dress conservatively. It's estimated that by 2020, the industry will be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Our reporter Georgia Tolley has been sampling styles in Dubai, one of the world's biggest markets for Islamic fashion. We are Esma Dubai, the French Fashion Institute. Dozens of students are graduating tonight with a fashion show featuring their final designs. Esmod is one of the world's top international fashion schools and the students who attend its Dubai Institute come from 11 different countries. Many of the collections reflect the sensibilities of the region. Dresses are loose and flowing with sleeves tailored to the wrist. Though notably, none of the models wear headscarves. Backstage, I asked some of the graduates what they think about modest fashion. My name is Hassal Boutishrahe and I'm an Emirati. I'm wearing Abaya with a cape right now. So I just want to show people, be modest, but you can also be fashionable at the same time. I'm Ola. I'm from Damascus, born in Dubai. We live in a country that most of the people like to wear modest clothes. When we someone wearing modest, we don't say that it's modest, it's fashion. It's not surprising that students at a fashion school in the Middle East are inspired to create clothes that cover. But for nearly a decade now, successful female designers like Jill Sander, Phoebe Philo and Victoria Beckham have been creating mainstream designs that wouldn't look out of place in a Middle East mall. But why is modest fashion enjoying such a boom time now? The director and founder of Esmod Dubai, Tamara Hostal, has a theory. For sure, this is even the worldwide trend. I think it comes because 20, 30 years ago, uh, some young ladies or men have exaggerated their behavior and they have shown too many. So now this is a contrary and ladies want to have more closed clothes. Alia Khan is the founder and chairwoman of the Islamic Fashion and Design Council. She advises both luxury and high street retailers on how to create clothes for the modest market. I met her in her favourite clothes store. 
every large brand that you see and and every even mid-size or even the smaller brands are embracing modest fashion and I don't blame them they are very eager to grasp a bit of the market share which is a large market share depending on what report you read we're looking at something like 400 billion dollar plus spending power that is huge and if this part of the fashion industry were a country it would be number three after China and USA What's nice is, even though we're the Islamic Fashion and Design Council, we have a very strong secondary following, which is of the Jewish, the Christian, and even the non-faith-based modest consumers who just prefer the modest lifestyle over the mainstream. So why is this market suddenly so popular for women across all cultures? Alia reckons it's all down to Instagram. That good old selfie is one of the primary reasons why we have so much popularity in this space. So we've got influencers with millions of followers because people just appreciated their sense of style whilst being able to wear their scarf, whilst being able to meet all the parameters of modesty and look darn good. Alia Khan of the Islamic Fashion and Design Council, ending that report from Georgia Tolley. The problem of plastics entering the oceans is an ongoing battle worldwide, but scientists here in the UK say they've found a solution to at least one plastic pollutant and arguably one of the worst microbeads. Researchers say they've created a biodegradable alternative to the tiny microplastics which can get into the food chain as well as into the oceans. Henry Bella reports. Every year, close to 30,000 tonnes of tiny plastic particles known as microbeads are washed into oceans and ultimately into the stomachs of seabirds and marine life. The small beads found in exfoliating face scrubs and toothpastes may seem harmless, but they're almost impossible to remove and only add to the growing plastic soup swirling in our oceans. Richard Thompson, a marine biologist at the University of Plymouth, says that more than 700 species have to deal with marine debris such as microbeads. Many of those species are already considered endangered or threatened, and that also includes commercially important species, the fish and shellfish that we want to consume. And so microbeads consumed by a fish may eventually pass back up the food chain and also be consumed by humans. Many countries have now banned the sale of microbeads, but in the United Kingdom and other nations, they're still available in shower gels and toothpastes. In the absence of a global ban, a small startup at the University of Bath in England has discovered a biodegradable alternative made with a solution of cellulose. The researchers have been given nearly $600,000 to develop a prototype for mass production, which could provide a low-cost alternative for manufacturers. If it's successful, the breakthrough may reduce the equivalent of 5 billion plastic bottles that are washed into our waterways each year. Henry Bello reporting now. Britain's Royal Air Force are switching up their strict rules on facial hair, allowing beards for the first time in more than 100 years. They say the move is to promote inclusivity, but that wacky designs won't be tolerated. Here's Rihanna Croxford. Blonde beards, brown beards, black beards and ginger beards. Soon they'll all be welcome within the ranks of airmen in the RAF. The Ministry of Defence says the move will promote inclusivity and help attract a wider range of talent. But there'll still be conditions. It says any facial hair must be smart, neatly trimmed, cover the whole jawline and be no longer than 10 inches to maintain a high standard of appearance. The MOD told the BBC that the ban had previously been in place for historical health and safety reasons, such as in the event of a chemical or biological weapon attack where staff could struggle to seal a gas mask. The decision will bring the RAF in line with the Royal Navy, which has always allowed bids. But the MOD says it has no plans to lift the ban in the army. Rihanna Croxford reporting. And that's all from us for now. There will be an updated version of Global News to download later. And if you'd like to comment on this edition or the stories we included, do drop us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. My name's Andrew Peach. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.